You know, as I was preparing this message this morning, one of the things that uh, kind of went through my mind is I think that Roger would have enjoyed the sermon this morning. The name of this sermon is The Cult of the Willfully Ignorant and the Dumbing Down of America. And that would have been one that he would have liked. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel 12 and 4. And how many know that we're really in the last of the last days? Um... It doesn't take a brainiac to figure that one out. I think a blind man can see it. But this is one of the things that God told Daniel that we're actually seeing today. And it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. How many know we're there? And I look at one of the things that precipitates the opening of the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. I want to deal just a minute with the running to and fro. And that's not talking about people at Walmart. It's talking about the ability to travel. I'm amazed. Next month I've got to go to Canada, way up in Prince Albert. And you know what? Here, just 100 years ago, that would have been a month's journey probably or more. And now I'm going to leave in the morning, arrive there in the evening, preach the next day. The amazingness of that. We can actually go to places and never leave home. Do you know that you can go on the Internet and you can see places and scan around and walk through buildings and never leave your home? It's amazing with the technology that we have available today. But he also said in the last days that knowledge shall increase. And this Hebrew word here for increase is rabbah, which means uh, to become much, to become great, to become abundant. And that's really on, on a lot of different levels. We're learning more today. The sciences are, are almost getting to the place where they're frightening. Some of the things that they can do. I read the other day that the, the, the drones that our government has us, has flying around American airspace now. Now they're not supposed to be armed but they can tell if you're armed. Flying way up in the sky can tell if you have a weapon in your pocket or not. We have, I saw a report this week, they're they're working with nanotechnology to put V-Venom, V-Ventum, there you go, into nanotechnology, inject it in your body, and it'll go right to the cancer cells and kill the cancer cells with V-Venom. That's scary. Or now we can fight warfare. We can can have a PFC sitting back in a bunker in America controlling armed, armed drones on the other side of the planet and just choose. It's almost like playing a video game. Just the knowledge. And one of my concerns is our knowledge is surpassing our morality to be able to handle it. But there's another aspect that I want to deal with today, and it's there is a new cult forming in the church. You know, because I believe the Bible people want to call me a cult, so I might as well go ahead and return the favor. (laughs) Is there is a cult forming in the church that are willfully ignorant. I call them the ostrich clan. They're wanting to stick their heads in the sand while prophecy hits the other end. And they get mad at you whenever you bring up facts about anything. All they care about is what the flesh wants to hear. In a time, guys, now, I've got part of my library back there, and I've got a lot of it at home, but, you know, i got most of it digitalized now. Just in what we have access to, that now I can pull up my Bible program, I can go through 5,000 volumes of materials for a subject that I'm looking for within a matter of seconds and be able to clip it and paste it right into what I'm doing. I don't have to go and try to remember, now what volume was that in and what book was that in and all these different things. I can do it instantly. And see, this is actually too big for today's world. There are two libraries that I have that I can carry around on my iPad. 
And I can read the Anti-Nicene Fathers on my iPad. I can read Chef's Christian History, all six volumes, on my iPad. They say, well, Mike, that's still too big. You better see a Kindle. I want you to talk about technology. I can be sitting anywhere where there's Wi-Fi, if you have one of these ones with WhisperNet on it. I can buy a book, and within three to ten seconds, I can begin reading it. And I've got over 100 books I didn't pay for. They're free. Most of Andrew Murray's stuff is free. Ian Bound's stuff is free. I got Wiley's three-volume set on systematic theology, Christian theology. I got it Amazon for free. So here is all this knowledge that you can set and you can put in your pocket. I can have over 2,000 books on this, stick it in my pocket, and pull it out and read it any time that I want to. And now we have Christians that choose to be ignorant. There is more word available in many different forms ever before. This, this video that I'm doing today, within a couple of weeks, we're going to have people in Ireland listening to it off the net. We're going to have people in Africa downloading it in MP3. We're going to have people in former Soviet Union bloc nations downloading it and listening to it and watching it on YouTube. We have our own on-demand channel. That if you can't think you can get your fill of me just going, you can watch me anytime you want to. Yeah, right. Bless your little heart. This glutton for punishment. <laughs> on your iPhone, on your iPad, anything that you, you, you can watch it, you can, you can download. Not only me, but hundreds and hundreds of preachers. That knowledge is increasing. Right. And let me know there are good preachers and there are bad preachers. There are preachers that are willfully ignorant that preach to the willfully ignorant. That's not what God call, has called us to do. If we're going to be able to figure out what Daniel had closed to him, we have all got to become students of God's word. We've got to dig a little deeper. 2 Timothy 2.15. This is one of the first ones. I remember on my 13th birthday I surrendered to the ministry. And the next week, my pastor met with me, and he handed me two verses. I had to memorize, uh, I had to memorize 2 Timothy 2.15 and Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, right out of the chute. This is not just instruction to, in, to Timothy. This is instruction for all believers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, most of us always stop there. Now, that, that is our call, but the reality around us is in verse 16. But shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And let me tell you something right now. The Christian airways are full of vain babblings and profanity. Why? <laughs> you want to know why? Because this, this goes back to Timothy. Let's jump over to 2 Timothy 4. I, I love 2 Timothy. The heart of Paul is, he, Paul is really pulling out his heart to Timothy. This is the last epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote. In fact, experts and historians tell us that he finished it the night before he gave his life for the gospel. And so he's, he's pouring out the last bit of instruction that he can give to Timothy. Now look at this in, in 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Now how are you supposed to preach? Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. How many know that doesn't happen very much in pulpits anymore? Rebuking don't make me feel too good. It'll save your soul. It'll save a lot of trouble in your life. But he goes on to say, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lush shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now we could talk about the fable and Christmas and Easter, but let's just set those aside. We deal with that a lot here anyway. All right? This is one of the things that God told me this morning. Is that most preachers 
today no longer obey 2 Timothy 2.15? Let me tell you something. If you've got a preacher that doesn't have a library, you're in trouble. I've, I've, I've visited some preachers before. How big's your library? Four books. How long have you been preaching? 30 years. We're in trouble. You don't even have anything to exegete out of the, out of the Word of God. I have introduced lexicons to ministers that have been in ministry for 30 years. Some of them didn't even know what the back half of a Strong's Concordance was for. When the guys in my church, whenever we have a Bible study, guys, they can whip out their, their iPhone or their smartphone, and they're starting to give me Greek and Hebrew definitions at a push of a button. But a preacher doesn't know how to use a Strong's number. Do you know what? This is what God told me. He said, he, said, he said, preachers are no longer seeking my face about what to preach. They thumb through the Christian television stations and find out what everybody wants to hear and begin preaching that. That draws that guy a big crowd. It'll draw me a big crowd. So you have an ostrich with his head stuck in the sand preaching to ostriches with their head stuck in the sand. Because it all goes down to sound bites. Today's believer wants sound bites. He doesn't want sound doctrine. Come on now. I'm not under the law. Well, if you're saved, you're not, because what Paul was talking about was the convicting power of the word. If you're saved, you're not supposed to be convicted of sin anymore. But you actually got to read a couple of verses before that verse and a couple of verses after that verse to be able to understand what he's talking about. We overemphasize the, the love of God. And how many know God's love is great? But the Bible never says God is love, love, love. But it does say is holy, holy, holy. We take snippets out of things. Lust is driving the Christian market today. It's drive the lust of the flesh. Just tell me I'm okay and that everything my flesh and my sinful nature wants to do is okay and that I'm going to get to heaven doing the same things I did before I got saved. I saw a cartoon this morning on, or last night on Facebook. I thumbed through it. And it had, this, it had this family sitting around the table praying over, over maybe it had been Easter dinner, but it was, it was a big ham setting on the table. And it said, thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross and enabling me to eat that which your word in Leviticus has declared as an abomination. <laughs> Ignorance. When all you got to do is, today is just push a couple of buttons to find out what the Greek and the Hebrew means a lot of times. And it clears it all up. But we would choose, we don't, Chuck, I don't want to trust in a sound bite. It may be the wrong one. Well, that's the sound bite you're going to live by. Judas went and hung himself. Say, why do you always bring that one up? Because you start living by sound bites, that's exactly where you're going to end up. You're going to end up in a noose that you constructed. That's, right. that's going to choke the very life out of you. Here's one of the things that I have found out. Itching ears will pay good money to hear what their flesh demands. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of guys on Christian TV right now that I will call Brother Itching Ear. <laughs> and they fill stadiums. Yeah, they, do. they fill stadiums. You can't have dominion over sin when sin has dominion over you. You can't reign when something else is reigning over you. And what's interesting in 2 Timothy 2... The Apostle Paul warns him about two different preachers that were preaching corrupt things. And he, he goes on to say, he said, their words are like canker in the King James. That means gangrene. Their words that, that everybody wants to hear and, and the words that are not sound doctrine 
are like gangrene in the body of Christ. What happens if you get gangrene in the body? That member has to be cut off. Oh, that'll preach. The only way to save the body is to lose the member. And their words are infecting because we have an entire generation that do not want to be corrected. They do not want to be told what is right or what is wrong. They say, I want to choose, and that's where I'm going to go to church, if they go to church, is what pleases me. You know, it used to be a time when I read some of the old ones, like McLaren and McEachern in church history. Everybody was worried about finding out what pleased God. That we were, we were so enamored with Jesus because he came, the perfect Lamb of God, had no sin. He did not have to come. He came and died one of the most horrific deaths possible just to forgive our sins. And out of, out of gratitude for that, I wanted to learn how to please him. Even within Judaism that does not recognize Messiah, they believe that the highest form of worship is study. They study God's word to find out what makes him happy, what he hates. They try their best to avoid what he hates and to do what he likes. And they call that the highest form of worship. And yet we have Christians this weekend that'll get up and raise their hands and say, I adore you. But the minute they walk out the door, they don't give him another thought. The willfully ignorant. In the last days, you're not going to be prepared for prophecy. You're not going to be prepared for that which was even shut up to Daniel. This is a generation that we should be continually learning. And I mean with the technologies today, you can fit it in. You can, you can buy audio book. Driving down the highway, listening to good teaching, listening to good preaching, listening to something to improve yourself. Almost on any subject that you want to learn, not, not, just, re, not just biblical, but any subject you want to learn, you are just a push button away. Do you know Mary and I dreaded with our, with our chickens, we dreaded trying to figure out how to, how to clip their wings. You know, we've never done that before. All I know is you put food in one end, and it comes out the other along with a bunch of other stuff. You know, that's about all I knew. <laughs> Mary goes to YouTube. Trimming chicken's wings. We watched about three minutes on that. We went outside in 15 minutes. We had it done. I'm thinking, I dreaded that for three weeks, and it just, you know. You, you, but, well, once you have the knowledge, you're up for the challenge. Once you have the knowledge, you know how to handle yourself. You know what you're supposed to be doing. And it's that way in every single area of life. How do I really walk with God? Let me find out what he says about it. Open the book. My pastor just preached a message. In fact, we posted it to the biblical, uh, our, our church website called Hope in a Book Rediscovered. And he was talking about just like in Josiah's day when they rediscovered the Torah, we've got to rediscover the word of God again. Get back in the book. Let's quit asking each other's opinion and let's start finding out what God's opinion is. <laughs> Guys, not only this generation, not only are they trusting in sound bites instead of sound doctrine, they prefer cliches over the counsel of God. A cliche will send you to hell. It will make your life a living hell. Let's get back in real truth. Now, in America, we have another quandary that I have been kind of turning my attention to. Because after World War II, now prior to World War II in America, most of like the universities and colleges, they are what were called societal colleges. High society. If, uh, let's say if, if, if I belong to a certain family, I was guaranteed entrance into Harvard because I belong to that family. And only certain minorities and different things got in. Well, then, after World War II, a lot of the things changed. And up until that time, in most universities, there was a small group of people called intellectuals, the eggheads. And I can say that because I am one, okay? The eggheads were kind of contained by the, the social professors. After that, things began to change. 
And at first it opened up some wonderful doors. It opened up the doors to the Jewish community. And they came in and, and said, listen, you know, study is the highest form of worship. And they began teaching some of these principles. But it was quickly hijacked. How many know in the 60s things changed? Things began to change. And they, they took things that at first they espoused what is called a meritocracy when it comes to education. That means you got to get a, a 90 to 100% to have an A. That, that's about right, isn't it? 80, 70, 80, 80, 89% of B. And so they developed something called SAT tests and all these different tests you've got to go through to college to find out where you are and all these different things and so that you, you were able to get into college based upon merit. And it was that way in school. You're supposed to actually pass first grade before you get to second. Pass second grade before you get to third. Along the way, you're supposed to learn how to read, write, add and subtract, basic things you're going to need the rest of your life. But then we had another group begin to come in that rejected God. Absolutely rejected God. In fact, the Apostle Paul warns us about them in Romans chapter 1, verses 22, uh, 21, 22. Because that they knew God, they glorified him not neither as God, neither were thankful, yet be became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened, professing themselves to become wise, they have become fools. That is the state of the American educational system today, and the church is reflecting that same system. Professing themselves to become wise, they become as fools. And see, that's really a, that, that is a trigger word in a Hebraic thought there is a psalm that says, and the fool will say in his heart, there is no God. That's one way of interpreting that, but if you read it in the Hebrew, it can be interpreted this way, and the fool said in his heart, no God. He told God no. And a lot of what is based in American education today, they really know there is a God and that he's the God of this Bible. They hate him, they hate this book, and they attack it viciously. And in doing so, they have left all true knowledge. There was a time in history that some of the greatest thinkers on the planet said that the greatest science that exists is the science of theology to discover and to know God. Now these guys are trying to tell us they're becoming gods. At one time in America, when this book was reverenced in our educational system, our educational system, K through college, was the envy of the entire world. The envy. Everybody came to America to get educated, didn't they? The entire educational system was originally set up by our founding fathers so that men and women could learn the Word of God. In fact, Congress printed the first Bibles in America that were ever printed in America was done on tax dollar by the Commission of Congress. And now we're being stupefied. Anti-God everything. I saw this week... In <laughs> Some of the things that are coming out are, are really crazy. Did you see this week where this young little kid was suspended because he was munching on his Pop-Tart and realized he could munch it into the shape of a gun. And so he's holding a Pop-Tart gun, and they suspend him over it. And the next day, they got to bring counselors into the, into the rooms for any of the children who were traumatized by a Pop-Tart gun. Excuse me, that's stuck on stupid. We no longer, when we have competition, have first, second, and third place. Everybody gets a participation trophy. Now, that's actually the opposite of the way the intellectual community started after World War II. And meritocracy means you get first place because you got first place. And if you got last place, you got last place because the scores don't lie. Now we're being taught the scores don't matter. You know why? We're being dumbed down. The church is being dumbed down. 
they don't know their spirit. One of the reasons I harp so much on spiritual authority is most believers don't know it. Now, how many times over the years have I taught on spiritual authority here? Uh, if you could count how many liver pills, pills Carter had, you could figure it out. So I'm, I'm just finishing a series. I'm getting phone calls from far away as Canada saying how awesome that teaching was on, spirit, on biblical authority. And I'm thinking, yeah, the 500th time. It's because people are so hungry because that they don't know they have never been taught. If you're dumbed down, the devil can control you. One of the things that made America great is it made education available for everybody so that everybody could learn to write, to read, to discover, to learn. And now in our laziness, we don't want to learn. When we sat with every device our forefathers would have given an arm for to have, we sat there and we don't use them. Well, the talking heads on TV are going to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Right up to the time they tell you, you have to take a mark. Yeah, that's right. For the safety of the planet. For the safety of your community. Now, you also have no choice since we took all your weapons. We took all your guns. And the only now guys with guns are the ones with jackboots on that's going to come and give you the mark. Can you see where this thing is headed? Here's one that really just blew me away. I was watching here about a month ago. How many of there's, there's a, it's, it's good, it's an anti-bullying program you know, they're trying to do in schools. To, uh, okay, I, I was skinny. I was a walking thermometer with legs. You know, back when I was a kid, if you wanted to draw a portrait of me, a stick figure would have done, okay? And I was ridiculed for day one about it. So I, I understand about bullying. And so here's this guy commissioned by our president to go into schools to do an anti-bullying program. And the first thing he does, he starts mocking the Word of God. And kids begin to get up and protest. And he begins to mock and bully them. The anti-bullying monitor is bullying people. How's that for an oxymoron? Paid for by government dollars. There's been some things come to light. It's called C-Scope. And you better be aware of it in your own schools. I saw some things on Glenbeck. They, they had the, one of the legislators from Texas talk about it. And what's interesting about it is now almost every teacher in America in K-12 through 12 is required to use it. It's not published by the government, although they use government money for it. They formed a private, non-for-profit corporation with government funds. No one's allowed to review the curriculum. Nobody. Only the teachers and the, 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 the parents aren't allowed to see it. That should have raised up a red flag because in America, all curriculum has to go through the state. The parents have got to take a look at it. They've got to debate, this is what we want, these are the standards. You know what I have found out? Darkness and sin hates light. Now, they quoted copyright laws. You know, there's, there's copyright laws so nobody can get a hold of it. Every one of those books back there in that library is copyrighted. Doesn't make sense, does it? But it does if you want to hide propaganda. They have rewritten American history in Orwellian style. Now, for those of you who don't know what Orwellian style is, there's a book called 1984 that the government goes back and rewrites history for whatever is politically correct at the time. They're doing that today. According to them, Paul revered the reason that he ran, you know, and said the British are coming, the British are coming, because he got busted the week before for drug possession. That the guys who did the Tea Party were terrorists. Terrorists. They no longer teach the kids about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or any of the founding fathers. They're teaching them and they're making heroes out of socialists and communists. Before they teach them anything about America. 
This curriculum hails and champions socialism and uh, socialism and communism and says how bad America is. You know, for being the worst nation on earth, everybody seems to want to move here for some reason or another. And what's interesting to me, they're all wanting to get out of those socialist nations. Mike, why are you preaching all this? I've been teaching on authority. You're going to have to take authority over your own education. God holds you responsible. We're going to have to take authority. God's going to require of us to learn the word. God's going to require of us to do the research. And for those of us that have smaller children, you better start buying textbooks that teach the right thing now because they may not be available here in just a little bit. You see, all this curriculum, and this, this is what really just smacked me of Orwellian flavor. They each, you can't even stockpile it. You go up, and the teacher that week downloads it off the Internet and prints it out. You know what that means? It can be rewritten from week to week, however the political winds blow. Okay, now we've got them this far over into, into being against God. Let's go ahead and get them this far over. Then we rewrite it and we get them this far over. Every Christian home should have some type of library. Just some basic things. Every home should have a strong coordinates. You can get Brown, Drivers, Briggs, and Thayer's all keynoted to Strong's to learn Hebrew. All you got to do is be able to count. Find 2432 in the Greek section, and you can actually discover what that, what that original word is. You don't have to go to seminary anymore to be able to, get to use the basics. Open up a dictionary. You know what? It's revelatory to me that I don't have to use Strong's, Brother Chuck. I don't have to use Thayer's. I don't have to use Kittle's. I can use Webster's to find out what these words in this book actually mean. And sometimes you find out that preachers don't even understand the definition of an English word when they're reading it from the Word of God. And to correct their preaching, all you got to do is open up a dictionary. Do you know what will stop that? Is when the people in the pew get smart. I heard Malcolm Smith come into a church one time, and he's another Bible teacher, and he said, what I'm getting ready to do, he says, it's going to be wonderful for you, but it's going to be hell on any preacher that ever gets in this pulpit after I get done. Because what he did is he spent three weeks teaching them how to study the Word of God, how to use concordance, how to use lexicons, how to, how, the proper mode of interpretation of the Bible. And so he left, and he said, I begin getting... I began getting emails and letters from this church saying, we can't really find anybody that can stand behind the pulpit because they get to doing stuff. My people start shaking their heads, no. <laughs> Don't know what the word says. <laughs> if we educate ourselves, you can discern what is right and what is wrong. That's part of what God's commandments are. This is holy. This is profane. This is just, this is unjust. In the last days, they're going to call good evil and evil good. And if you go by the talking heads on the TV box, you're going to go along saying that all this good is really evil. You better find out what God says because it's eternal. And let me tell you something. In just a few years, and I don't know if it's going to be two years or 30 years, there's a new administration coming. There is a new administration coming on this planet. There's a guy that they nailed to the cross to kill, to get out of the way, who wouldn't stay dead, who left an empty grave, who's coming back, and he's getting ready to establish a new administration. And that administration is based upon this right here. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And the commandments of God are going to flow like a river out of Jerusalem. And since that is going to be the permanent 1,000 year to come government, I choose to be politically correct according to that government. I'm learning how to move in that government now. I'm learning how to function in that government now. 
because that's the one that's going to abide. I find when I read prophecy that all the things, now Satan has been working for 2,000 years to get to the place where he could have his Antichrist. 2,000 years. And did you know that he doesn't even reign the entire tribulation period? He only reigns the last three and a half years. The last three and a half years. Took him 2,000 years to set things up, and he sets up a government that can't last over three and a half years. Not even one. He's less than a one-term president. And he has the entire world convinced except for a remnant. And how many decide they want to be that remnant? You better learn how to learn for yourself. God gave you a brain. Use it. We have a generation. All of us know how to read. That, that is a gift that past generations would have died for. Did you know that actually it's probably some of your very forefathers gave their lives for you to have the ability to read, the right to read, and to read the Word of God? I can imagine what they're saying in heaven if they look down and see how much dust our Bibles collect. When they gave their lives for the right for you to have that book. We have got to reclaim our right to re-educate ourselves. Don't let this world do it for you. Willfully ignorant. Don't live by sound bites. Dig a little deeper. I am tired of this. Now, I want you to teach me how to be victorious and walk with God, and I want you to do it in 30 seconds or less. Can't. Why? Because you're the biggest mess I've ever seen. It's going to take a while. Okay? All of us are. I want to read 2 Timothy 2.15 again because, guys, it's time for us to develop the discipline of putting motion to our devotion. I'm going to read it again out of the Amplified Bible. Study. And be eager and do your utmost. You sound like that was an imperative for the Apostle Paul? Do you know when he was in prison, he called for his books to be brought to him? He said, bring me my books. I, I got some research. I got some epistles I got to write, you know. Present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial, a workman that has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling, and skillfully teaching the word of truth. And you know, every one of you are Bible teachers. Every one of you. By how you live it. You're teaching those around you the reality of God. And see, if we'll get this right, with the darkness that's coming... If you're a light, the darker things around you, the better you are. I can go out here with my, with my big truck out here, and I can turn on the high beams right now outside, and it won't seem like very much. But on a new moon, when there's no moon, those headlights will blind you. You see, this could be our finest hour. That when the world is, is absolutely saturated in darkness, we can become the light of God in this world if we'll start preparing now, if we'll start studying now. While everybody else is being politically correct and worrying about their civil rights, we're moving in kingdom rights and being kingdom correct, and we're walking in another kingdom that supersedes their kingdom. This is the greatest hour. You have the greatest opportunity, but we have to make it a priority. Quit trusting the talking heads. Guys, and, and I'm an educator, and there's a lot of guys, and they say, Dr. So-and-so is coming on this expert. His Ph.D. really stands for post hole digger because all he does is dig himself a deeper hole every time he opens his mouth. Seek out kingdom correct things. Kingdom correct. If the, all the world is doing it, don't. That's just, that's just a good rule of thumb. If the whole world thinks it's the coolest thing, that, boy, you got to be hip. You know, some of them stick their hair straight up, you know, use enough gel to... 
they, you know, they, they can become the biggest fly trap on the planet just where that stuff gets moist. And the, it, did you ever see the, the, this, the models and stuff? They do some of the goofiest things. And I look at that and I think, that's just freaky. I'm, maybe I'm getting old, but I look at this and that is just freaky. They have rings and stuff and sticking out of everything except their ears, you know. And they're saying, that's attractive. I'm thinking, well, maybe to a blind man, but not to anybody that can see. And what, what we don't realize, you know, that all that is actually a social experiment. I've read testimony of witches that used to work on Park Avenue where all advertising is done, where they set these trends. And they say, we just sway the nations, just like they're puppets on a string. And we just see how far we can push them. Have you ever felt like on TV shows some things that... Ten years ago, they would have never dared do on TV, and now they're just seeing just how far they can push things. Just, you know, how many times in a comedy do you need to bring up sex? And yet it's about, it's about four times every ten minutes. How I many there's more to life than that? And they just, they just push all this stuff on us, constantly pushing it on us. And we're sitting there saying, that's the new norm. That new norm will take you straight into the arms of the Antichrist. It's time to break the back of the willful ignorant. If I'm serving Christ, I have been set free. My mind has set, been set free so that I can learn and I can begin walking according to his kingdom. And I don't want you guys to ever take anything I say just because I say it. I want you to study. I want you to research it out. The greatest compliment I have ever gotten is when somebody says, I listened to a sermon. I spent three weeks researching it. And you know what? I agree with you. I thank glory to God. He studied three weeks just to make sure. Instead of just taking everything face value, study for yourself. Get in this book yourself. There's hope in this book. There's light and life in this book. Everything of this world is to try to take you away from this book. Why? You know what? They're, they're standing on what they're destroying, and what they're destroying is the very thing this book built. Well, Father, even though the spirit of ignorance thinks that it's ruling and reigning in this day, Father, every, over every household that listens to this, Father, I rebuke the spirit of ignorance, and Father, I lose a hunger for truth. I, Father, our desire is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Father, I ask that you would loose the anointing of the Holy Spirit who is to teach us all things. Father, loose a learning anointing on us, a hunger to know your ways, a hunger to know truth, a, a hunger to know exactly how to prepare ourselves and our families for the days ahead. And Father, that can be anything from righteous living to food preparation, Father, and, 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 and even basic medical care. Father, all these things teach us we do not want to trust in this world we want to trust in you and in your kingdom yes. now father we're inviting heaven to invade our comfort zones to invade our downtime and begin using those times as times to improve ourselves to learn more of you and to learn more of how to live this life and to do the things you have called us to do and, Father, we stand as a congregation day, and we rebuke ignorance off every area of our lives. And we say that we have the supernatural ability of God to learn. If we have the mind of Christ, we can learn, and we can reason, and we can think things through and find out the mind of God on every subject. And, Father, loose it in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name.